Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Sunday morning meeting of the Humanists of Greater Portland. My name is Jeff Strang, and I'll be the MC for today. I also play the role of secretary on the HGP Board of Directors. Our Zoom host is Dave DiNucci, who's also our president. The Humanists of Greater Portland is a chapter of the American Humanist Association. Humanism is a non-theistic worldview with ethical values informed by scientific knowledge and driven by a desire to meet the needs of people in the here and now. At the foundation of those values is an affirmation of the dignity of every human being. As usual, we'll start our program today with a reading, this week by Al Christians, who also happens to be our reading coordinator. Take it away, Al. I've got one from out of the archives here. It's, yeah, this is from an essay by Clinton W. Gilbert, who was a, um, uh, a newspaper man and essayist in England. And the, this was published around 1922. It also makes reference to um, another essay by an English newspaper man and, and writer and novelist, Mr. C.E. Montague. Uh, and his book, Disenchantment, which was a book written again around 1922 about the um, experience of the British doughboys coming home from World War I and finding that all the things they fought to defend are in worse shape than they were when they went away to fight the war. And uh, the oracle that always says no is a, is about how people get persuaded into doing things that just are pretty dumb. And this is what Clinton W. Gilbert says. And we find in the child mind and foster it by education, the will to believe that great American virtue. Oh, that's right. Gilbert was an American. The other guy was an Englishman, excuse me. It requires an immense will to believe to grow up in the family and in society, looking at the elders and all, all the, at all that is established and accepting all the information that mankind has slowly accumulated and which teachers patiently offer. If the young once doubted, once thought, but unfortunately they do not. Anyway, we do find in the child mind the will to believe of immense social utility. Now the will to believe like teeth which decay if not used upon hard food or muscles which grow flabby if they have not hard work to perform must be given something for its proper exercise. In a chapter on the duty of lying in his brilliant book, Disenchantment, Mr. C.E. Montague shows what may be done with the will to believe developed as it has been at last. Quote, during the, last, during the war, the art of propaganda was little more than born. In the next war, the whole sky would be darkened with flights of tactical lies so dense that the enemy would fight in a veritable, veritable fog of war, darker than London's own November brews, and the world would feel that not only the angel of death was abroad, but the angel of delusion too, and would hear the beating of two pairs of wings. And what may be done with the will to believe in time of war has immense lessons for the days of peace. Whether we're at peace or war right now, I guess doesn't really matter then. A British Tommy quoted by Mr. Monty, who summed up the moral advantages. They tell me we've pulled through at last all right because our propaganda dished up better lies than what the Germans did. So I say to myself, if telling lies is all that bloody good in war, what bloody good is telling truth in peace? What bloody good is it when you have ready to hand the well-trained will to believe, which those who censored reason for its social disutility set up as the most serviceable attribute of the human mind? Thank you, Al. That's got definite implications for today's time. The topic of our meeting today is Deaths at Chemawa, presented by Ava Gugamos, Associate Professor at Pacific University, where she serves as a librarian overseeing archives and special collections.
She will be presenting on investigations into the deaths and burials of students who died while in the custody of Oregon's Indian schools. This fits into the larger picture of hundreds of unmarked graves of Native children at Catholic boarding schools in Canada and the U.S. Professor Gugamos, you're welcome to HGP, and we thank you for, your pre for presenting to us today. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, I'm glad to be here. And um, I just want to thank you all for inviting me. This is actually the second time that I've spoken with your group. Uh, the last time was pre-pandemic. Um, and I don't know if any of you remember me coming. <laughs> it's been a while. I think it was 2019 or so. Um, at that time, I spoke to you about the Forest Grove Indian School. Um, this time, I'm going to be talking a little bit about something a little bit different, um, which as Jeff said, is gonna be about um, a little bit about the overall history of Native American boarding schools in the US. Um, but more particularly, I'm gonna be talking about efforts to find and account for all of the Native children who died in these schools. Um, just as an aside, uh, yes, there were Catholic boarding schools, but there were also boarding schools by many other denominations, and there were many boarding schools that were directly administered by the government. So it was not just the Catholics involved, it was a wide variety of people involved in running these schools. Um, but before I get started, I always, um, I've been speaking a lot about these schools over the last few years, and I always like to just start out with um, an acknowledgement of something that might be obvious from looking looking at me, which is that um, I'm not native and my family was not personally affected by these boarding schools. Um, I'm not trying to claim in any way that I speak for the families or the children who went to these schools. Um, I'm only able to give what I can to this conversation as an historian and as an archivist. So that's the angle that I'm coming uh, to this from. This is going to be a pretty heavy talk. All right, so as I just said, I'm going to be speaking about deaths at the Chamawa Indian School. So many of you may have seen headlines like this. There were a lot of these out, uh, out in the news last summer that hundreds of unmarked graves of native children had been discovered in Canada on the grounds of former boarding schools. The first news that came out was about this one particular school named Kamloops, which is up in BC. Um, around 200 graves were found on the grounds of this school, all unmarked mostly in what um, was now an orchard. So these findings were done through ground penetrating radar, which is a, a type of they, they run a thing like you can see in this picture over the ground and they find disturbances in the soil without actually digging anything up. So um, this was an effort initiated by the tribe that um, is from this area. They found these graves. The tribes of course knew that many children had disappeared into the school, but because there were no markings on the graves, it was unclear exactly what had ever happened to these children. A lot of families just knew that a child back maybe in the 20s or the 30s or the 40s from their family had been sent to this school and then they never came home. And sometimes they never really heard what had happened to that child. They just knew that they didn't survive. So this was extremely worrying, of course, to the tribes and it became big news all over the world. Um, something that is less well known is that these schools were not only in Canada, they were also in the US and there are unmarked graves at similar kinds of schools right here in Oregon. But um, before I get into kind of the details of that story, I wanted to give a little bit of context um, some of you may already be familiar with this, but I just wanna give some context about what these boarding schools actually were and how they got started. All right, so most of us 
know the basic outlines of what happened in the 1800s, which was that U European Americans um, were expanding the territory of the United States ever westward, taking over native land as they went. In Oregon and Washington, uh, most of the tribes here in the Pacific Northwest signed treaties in the 1850s. Um, this on the left is just a picture of the treaty that was signed with the Tualatins. That's the tribe that was just to the west of you all um, over in Washington County. By the 1880s, nearly all tribes in the Pacific Northwest had been um, pushed onto reservations. This, of course, was not something that was a happy thing for the tribes, naturally. Um, some tribes resisted being forcibly removed. Other tribes resisted once treaties were broken, which happened many, many times. Um, and other tribes resisted when there were incursions from settlers onto the reservations trying to steal more land or killing native people. So what this all added up to was that between the 40s and the 70s, there was just war after war in the Pacific Northwest. Some of the big ones were the Yakima War, Modoc War, Nez Perce War, and Bannock War. But there were many other, oh, and Rogue River Wars. But there were many other small incidents that happened during this time period. What this meant was that um, a lot of the white people, not just in Oregon, but actually all over the West, were very concerned about tri the tribes. They, they saw the tribes as um, a threat and as being dangerous. And many um, white people actually thought at the time that the, the best solution to this would actually just be to either outright exterminate all of the native tribes or to just allow them all to die by like, you know, under, under resourcing them and not helping them. But there was a progressive wing uh, in politics that um, actually opposed that view. And it was made up of people like church leaders, um, Republican Party leaders, and actually some army officers who thought, well, wouldn't it be better instead of constantly fighting and killing Native tribes to instead um, essentially assimilate them into Western society. So that all of the things that make us fight between, you know, all of the fights between white people and these tribes would cease if there were no tribes. I'm smiling, but it's not a funny thing. It, this was a really pretty horrific solution to the problem. So this philosophy is summed up by the founder, um, this quote from the founder of the federal boarding school system in the United States, Richard Pratt, who said, um, the, the original quote is actually longer, but it's summarized as um, kill the Indian, save the man, which means that rather than killing people, we can kill the native culture and that that will solve the problem. How do we do that? Well, in a lot of ways, there's, this is, you know, many things were involved, but um, specifically what Pratt was talking about was creating schools where the children of native people would be taken away and then um, indoctrinated and not allowed to practice their, their native customs or speak their native languages and so on. So they would be sort of like removed from their families and then changed. This had a lot of appeal to a lot of people. This type of solution meant that, um, you know, this is what they promised anyway, that boarding schools would end the Indian Wars, create new converts for churches. This was a very important point that the schools by teaching the children to become farmers or tradesmen would allow the reservations to be broken up into individual plots and then the so-called excess land could be um, privatized and given to white settlers or um, given out as like things like mining rights or railroad rights. 
and in addition by training um, new farm hands and um, laborers you had this like additional source of labor who wouldn't be paid very much because they were not white. When they first started building the schools, I apologize, this photo is a little bit blurry, but when they first started building the schools, they actually started out building them on reservations. And so this has a long history, even earlier. This idea of teaching Native children to become white actually has a very long history. I'm really um, shortening up the history here in this talk, but in the Pacific Northwest, this effort began on the reservations. And so they began building schools in like the late 1860s through the 1870s. And so most of the reservations in the Northwest had schools there on the reservation. So for example, here's the school at Puyallup. Um, this is inside one of the schools at Umatilla. Um, this is a photo of children from Grand Ronde on an outing. Um, so they started on the reservations, but um, there was a problem with having these schools on the reservations. And so I'm just gonna give Grand Ronde as an example. So Grand Ronde, um, the, the reservation had a, had a relationship with the Catholics. So there were like Catholic missionaries working on the Grand Ronde reservation. Around roughly around 1870, um, the Catholic order there started a day school, which they forced the children on the reservation to attend. But, you know, they go to the day school, but then they'd come home at night to their families, who, of course, were speaking to them in their native languages and practicing native traditions and religion and all of those things. So that, from the point of the view of um, the schoolmasters, was not a good thing because they wanted to wipe out all of that. So they converted the day school to a boarding school on the reservation, which meant that kids were going to a boarding school that was only like three or four miles from their parents' house, which is bizarre. But they would, they would go to the boarding school and they'd be kept there. But the problem with that was that it was too easy for the children to run away. And many children did run away. You know, if you only had to run two or three miles to get home, well, you could just leave. And so kids would come home, their parents might, um, take them to go on traditional you know, events or harvesting or whatever. So this was not ideal. Even more kind of intervention was needed as far as the people were concerned who ran these schools. So the ultimate solution was um, federal boarding schools. The on-reservation boarding schools continue to operate, but Beginning in 1880, they began to pull students out of the on-reservation boarding schools and bring them to federal boarding schools. So the first one of these was the Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania, founded by Pratt, the guy who said, kill the Indian, save the man. And they were taking children from hundreds or even thousands of miles away and bringing them into the school, sort of like a, it was like a factory mentality for assimilating children. Children at schools like this were not only separated from their families, but they were often also separated from other children from their own tribe. And so from the point of view of the schoolmasters, that was a good thing because they couldn't even speak their own language because there was no one to speak it with. They couldn't practice their own traditions for the same reason. So this was a way to really break connections with tribal culture. Federal boarding schools, federal off-reservation boarding schools um, were eventually created in, you know, all over. So you can see here, there were eventually 25 of them created mostly in the Western United States. And if you'll notice, so number one is in Pennsylvania, but where's number two? Forest Grove. So just west of Portland. Why Forest Grove? Well, this isn't a lecture specifically about the history of the Forest Grove Indian School, but you can see kind of just geographically what space it was pulling from was all of Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Alaska. So there, that was, um, and, and I won't get into specifically why Forest Grove, but it had to do with 
church connections and also uh, Portland being a central place, but Forest Grove being a little bit farther away, it had a lot of uh, positive qualities as far as the schoolmasters were concerned. The federal system was not the only one though. Um, there were hundreds of schools like this that opened across the United States. This is a listing created by the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition of all the known schools. They're actually still adding names to this list, but um, you know, over 300 schools, uh, some run directly by the government and some run by churches. The effects of these schools was terrible. Um, you know, it, cre it caused immense cultural harm to tribes, many of whom lost all speakers of their languages, um, at least partially through the intervention of these schools. Many children suffered abuse and trauma. I won't get into the details, so it's very sad um, what many of these children went through. You know, just even if no abuse was happening at the school, forced separation from your parents for years at a time, beginning at age six or eight, was very hard on families. And then um, on top of that, there were many deaths in these schools. The total number of deaths has never been counted. And um, those total numbers are still unknown and the locations of many of the burials is still unknown. There are native groups, tribes and um, activist groups who have been calling for action on this for years. We finally have someone in charge of the Department of the Interior. That's the federal agency that oversees, has overseen and currently oversees um, native education. The current Secretary of the Interior is actually a native woman and she actually has personal experience with these schools. Her grandparents were taken, her great grandfather was taken. So she knows personally about what it means in these schools. When the news about the Kamloops school came out last year, Deb Howland put out a memo saying that the Department of the Interior would now officially investigate these deaths in the school, find out how many happened and um, where the burials are. So this is really a major development in, in sort of the response to these schools. So that, um, that work to account for things is currently underway in consultation with the tribes. All right, so that was some background information. Now I am going to talk more particularly about tracing deaths in Forest Grove and at the Chamawa Indian School. So I'm bringing this photo up first, this pair of photos. I showed you these um, when I came here in 2019, but I'm sure no one remembers <laughs> that well from, from three years ago. This is the most um, famous pair of photos from the school. It shows the same group of children before and after seven months in the Forest Grove Indian School. Um, so we can see a lot of things in these photos about how different the children look. But what I wanna point out here in particular is that there's a different number of children in the two photographs. And the child who is missing is one of the girls um, her name was Martha Lott. Um, we think, we're not sure, but we think she's the tallest girl in the back row. She was the daughter of Chief Lott, um, from whose tribe these children were taken. And we know a lot about the circumstances of her death. She was the first child who died at the Forest Grove Indian School. Um, she had something, possibly an abscess in her side. The infection spread and she died. Um, she was given a funeral and she was buried. So we know quite a lot about the circumstances of her death compared to most of the children who died in these schools. But despite that, we still didn't know where was she buried. The school kept, I would say, not always perfect, but somewhat good records about which children died because they were reimbursed based on how many children were attending. 
but burial records are a lot harder to come by. So it took a long time actually for us to figure out what, where Martha had been buried. Um, Forest Grove School, is, this is a picture of what the campus looked like. So I work you know, at Pacific University, which is in Forest Grove. That's how I got connected to this whole project. Um, and I've been working since I came to Pacific in 2011 to find out more about the school. Since I started working, we have found out a lot more, but um, you know, 10 years ago, we really did not know that much about what happened at the school. We knew like, you know, it had been here in the early 1880s. Um, we knew students from many different tribes were there, but we just didn't know that much detail. Um, we knew that the school had moved. So this is the connection between Forest Grove and Chamawa. Um, in 1885, the federal government decided to move the campus of the school. So it was in Forest Grove for five years. Then it moved to Salem, where it still is. So if you're driving down I-5, you may see signs for Chamawa near, um, well, it's just north of Salem, about five to 10 miles. So it's still there, very different school today than it once was. Um, so I didn't start to learn more detail about the history of these schools until I met um, this woman on the left. So that, her name is Shauna Hotch. And when I met her, she was a freshman at Pacific. And um, how I met her was, I was installing an exhibit in the library one day and she came up to me and introduced herself. And she said, hi, my name is Shauna. And I just graduated from Chamawa. Indian school and I would like to do a service project here in Forest Grove to um, clean up and honor the graves of the children who died at the Forest Grove Indian school. And I was like, I have no idea where these graves might be. Um, so I ended up hiring Shauna to work with me in the archives and we embarked on a project to um, try to document. We started out by trying to just get a list, a list of all the children who attended Forest Grove Indian School. Then um, we you know, recorded their tribes, alternate names they might be known by, when they were born and when they died and any other information we could find to kind of fill out the picture. We started building these spreadsheets. Um, then we went through the archives at Pacific and systematically scanned anything we could find that related to the school and put it up on a website along with those spreadsheets documenting names and dates of the students. Still though, so Shauna then moved on and the work has continued um, since she has left Pacific. And by the time she had left, we actually still had not found the graves of any of the children. It took a lot of digging to find this, but um, eventually someone in our local historical society shared a copy of a logbook from our local cemetery that showed that these two students, Martha Lott and Hugh Victor, were buried in plots that were simply unmarked. However, there are many more children who are not accounted for on these plots. So that took more work to try to find what happened to all the others. Um, I won't go through in detail like what we've been doing to try to find their locations, but I just want to say that probably overall, the most fruitful source of information has actually been the financial records of the schools. And that's because anything, you know, these were run by the federal government, so it was a huge bureaucracy. And anytime the school had expenses that weren't, you know, part of the budget, which included, you know, they couldn't predict who might die. So student deaths and burials were not part of the budget. So they would have to submit like special expenses to the government. So here we can see a water damaged, le da damaged ledger documenting the expenses for Martha Lott's burial. So over the years, I've been working on this for years now. And over the years, this has grown into a pretty extensive spreadsheet. Uh, this is just a small, small section of the spreadsheet documenting names, alternate names, death dates, enrollment dates, burial locations, causes of death, 
tribal identities, sources and notes, et cetera. There's many more columns that you're not seeing here. To sum up, for the Forest Grove School, which was only a five-year period of existence, um, 11, possibly 12 student deaths occurred during those five years. Most of those were due to tuberculosis. We have found two unmarked graves in the Forest View Cemetery. We believe that probably five of the others were um, brought home in the 1880s. We think that one may have been reinterred in the Tremawa Cemetery and three are unaccounted for, but I suspect that they were probably also um, sent back home. We just haven't found the records for it yet. But that was only the five year period that the school was in Forest Grove. Um, the school was in Chamawa from 1885 to the present. So a much longer time period. What happened when the students moved to Chamawa was um, that initially they had an extremely difficult time. When they moved to Chamawa, there were no buildings, like no dorms. So the children were um, told to make their own housing. So for the first year or two that they were there, many of the children were living in um, shacks that um, government inspectors were just absolutely, you know, the, the inspectors of the Department of the Interior that was also running the school were just shocked and, you know, dismayed at the at the state the school was in, mud was coming up through the floorboards of these shacks. Children were walking through mud that was ankle deep. They were covered in lice. Conditions were really, really bad. So during the first five years at Chamawa, 41 children died at a time when the average enrollment was around 300. So that means that you know, around 15% of the student population died. And um, that was not just, you know, sometimes we think, oh, well, many children used to die back in the days before vaccines and so on. This was a high number. You know, this wasn't, this would have, if this had happened at a white boarding school, you can bet that parents wouldn't have been sending their children there. Um, as the years went on, the conditions, the physical conditions, as far as the housing and so on, got better at Chamawa, but the institutional character got worse. So like it became more and more institutional. And the stories I've heard from survivor families whose you know, uncles or grandparents attended in the 20s and 30s, for a lot of children, it was just a real hell. They didn't have enough blankets. The food was inadequate and poor quality. Um, it was not a happy place to be. I mean, I don't want to say that the children never had anything positive happen. They did have caring. There were some staff members who cared. They did have some things that were good in their life. It wasn't 100% bad at all times, but it was still, you know, overall a really terrible place to have to live. During this time, up until about the 1930s, um, the late 1930s, if a child died at the school by default, they would be buried in the Chamawa School Cemetery. Uh, the only exception to that would be if the families were able to pay for the remains to be sent home, that, that expense was not covered by the government. So most of the children who died ended up buried um, on the school grounds. Now, um, as I mentioned earlier, I've been a scholar of the Forest Grove Indian School not so much of the Chamawa Indian School. So part of this story is about collaboration. Um, I certainly don't know everything <laughs> by any means. So one of the people who's been the most helpful in um, working through this history is um, this woman here, Sue Ann Reddick, who is a uh, historian of Chamawa. She's been working on the history for over 20 years, since the 1990s. So she, when I met her, we realized that our research kind of dovetailed. I had the Forest Grove part of the story and she had the Chihuahua part of the story. So we've been working together to kind of bring our research um, together 
Now, um, suspicions about what happened with the Chamala Cemetery have been, been around for a long time. So um, if you go to the Chamala Cemetery today, there's something very peculiar about it, which is that the graves date from the 1880s forward, but all of the graves that are pre-1945 have identical markers. Like they're all, they have different names and dates on them, but they're all the same metal and the same style. They're, they're clearly all made at the same time. So this is weird. You're thinking like, why would you know a grave from 1890 have the same metal marker as a grave from 1930? So this is strange. And there's also like areas of the cemetery that look like they should have graves in them, but there's no markers at all. And so, um, People have long suspected that there are, is something funny going on with the cemetery. So back in 2013, um, ground penetrating radar studies began to be done. And um, this one, you can see Marsha Small, she's the main native researcher who's been doing that work. And so she found what she suspected were many unmarked graves in the cemetery. And she also found that the markers didn't exactly line up with actual burial locations. So some, something strange was going on. Uh, what Sue Ann and I were able to do, okay, actually I need to explain why we did this. So when the, all of the uh, news about the Kamloops school came out last summer, Sue Ann, because she's one of the few published historians on the history of the Chamawa school, she started getting calls from reporters from places like the Statesman Journal and other places. And then she was referring them to me. So I was getting calls as well from journalists from all over the world, um, asking if we had any information about the situation of graves in the United States. We were very worried, Sue Ann and I, that media outlets might start sort of speculating or publishing incorrect information or just spreading, you know, things that weren't true. We had a lot of information in these spreadsheets, but we had never published all of it, especially Sue Ann had not published this information at all about what she knew of the graves. So we decided that we would try to get all of our research in a state that it could be shared about, about the graves in particular. Um, we did not do this, I just wanna say, we did not do this in a vacuum. We did not do this without you know, talking to native people. Sue Ann um, worked at Chamawa in the 1990s and then volunteered there for many, many years. So she had lots of friends among the alumni of Chamawa. So she was checking in with them. I was checking in, I have, um, I'm in contact fairly regularly with people at different tribes and their cultural departments. So I checked in with them as well. And, you know, obviously tribes are, are not a monolith. People have lots of different opinions, but overall we believed that um, what we were doing would be received as um, respectful and useful by the tribes. So we went ahead and took all of our spreadsheets. So I have to say I was deep into these spreadsheets for many, 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 many hours last, late last summer. Um, and in October, we published this website that documents for the first time exactly how many children died at Chmala and the Forest Grove Indian School, where they were buried, what they died from, which tribes they were from, um, effectively, the information that Deb Howland was calling for in her um, call for accountability. So we found that at least 270 students died in custody of the schools. That 175 Chamawa students were buried in the school cemetery, but that approximately 50 student remains are still unaccounted for. One of the kind of interesting outcomes of this work was that um, we had a map like a plot map that Sue Ann had gotten a hold of. I actually have a, she made me a giant copy of it. Um, 
my uh, camera is blanking it out on your screen, but she had a copy that she had gotten, I think in the 1990s of the original cemetery plot map, which was not widely known about as far as we could tell. So we digitized that as well. And then we made a clean copy with correct names. A lot of the names on the plot map were wrong, like they were spelled wrong. Some of the dates were wrong. We were able to correct it. And then by doing that, we realized that there were certain areas of the cemetery that were supposedly blank, like there's no nothing about who was buried there. But if you look at this, you can see this blank area on the map lines up with the 1892 to 1899 time period, like all the graves surrounding it are from that period. We think that we can match that with our list of all of the children who died and give some ideas about who is buried in these locations. And that's something that would not be possible without archival research. Another outcome from all of this is that we've put together what we think is a pretty good hypothesis about what actually happened to the cemetery, explaining why the markers all match and why they're offset from the actual grave sites. So we think that the first burial in the cemetery was in 1886. We suspect, we don't think that the children were just buried originally with no marker at all. We think that they were originally buried with something like a wooden marker. Um, this was pretty common back then. That would have been a lot cheaper than creating a stone, stone marker. So we think that they had wooden markers. Um, sometime in the early 1900s, they started recording the names, transferring names from the markers onto the plot map. But many of the names we think had become illegible already by that time period. That is why there were all these errors. Um, they ceased routinely burying children in the cemetery in the late 1930s. And so by 1960, because no one was being buried there anymore and the families were far away, the graveyard became kind of neglected and overgrown. Um, Sue Ann spoke with people who were still there, who were there in the 60s and remembered that there had been some sort of cleanup of the cemetery around 1960 that the cemetery was either backhoed or, you know, kind of severely mown to get rid of the brambles and weeds. But that also destroyed any remaining evidence of the original markers. And then the um, staff at the school had the students in the school's metal shop create the, all the markers to replace the original ones. And then they placed them where they thought the original graves were. So we think that that explains why there are these discrepancies and also why some graves weren't marked at all is probably because the original evidence was missing when they spruced up the cemetery in 1960. Okay, I've gone through a lot of detail and I just wanna kind of acknowledge at this point that um, I've been giving a lot of facts and figures, but there's, each of these deaths, you know, represents a real human life and a family behind it. And um, it was actually, I don't want to make this about me, but I just want to state that it's very hard emotionally to, I was working on these spreadsheets for months that were basically like, you know, lists of children who died under terrible circumstances. And um, being a mother of four children myself, it was really hard to go through this and not imagine, you know, what if it were my own family? I'm sorry to be so emotional right now. Um, but anyway, it's a hard thing. I can only imagine, you know, if it was hard for me as an historian, I can only imagine what it was like for the actual families who went through it. Um, I guess probably like many people here in this meeting, I'm not a religious person. I don't, you know, I don't personally believe in the afterlife, um, but it's at times like this that, you know, you almost wish <laughs> that there were, that you have that solace to kind of think like, well, these, these deaths won't be for nothing. And um, anyway, I just wanted to, to make that clear that there's also this kind of, it's not just a dry, 
historical research topic. It's, it's real lives. When we published this website, it garnered a lot of media attention, actually kind of an overwhelming amount. I've never had, you know, in all those years of being an archivist, I've had calls from the press before, but I've never had that many calls from the press. Um, we did a lot of interviews, a lot of articles were published. I'm mentioning this, you know, it's, it is, of course, gratifying as an historian. So rarely do people actually care <laughs> about what historians' research is. This was a case where people really did care. Um, but uh, I'm mentioning this not to, like, you know, say how great this project was, but just to say, like, this is actually really important that the media picks up stories like this, because this is how um, the families of people who died at these schools tend to find out about the existence of this information is through um, the media putting that information out there. And so we have gotten um, messages from multiple Native families saying, you know, uh, thank you, I'm, we found this information that we've always wondered about. And um, so we're hoping that this kind of project that we've done with Chamawa and the Forest Grove Indian School is what ends up happening for the entire boarding school system, both the um, on-reservation and off-reservation boarding schools. I think every one of these schools deserves this level of research and attention. Um, and for those children who are still unaccounted for, that's something that absolutely needs to be addressed. So I always like to end talks with talking about, you know, what can we actually do about this? Well, the first thing I want to state is that um, I've been talking about these Indian schools for a while and about the graves in public. And there's often immediate interest in saying, well, let's go do something. We know where those graves are in the Forest Grove Cemetery, for example. Shouldn't we go put a marker there? Shouldn't we put up a memorial? So I just want to say that this is these decisions about what happens with the graves really have to be made by the tribes. Like it's great that we want to help, but that's not our place to make decisions about, you know, whether a grave marker is placed or whether students might be reinterred in another location. That's a tribal decision. Um, for the Forest Grove graves, we have already been in contact with the tribes whose children are there and they are making those decisions. That's there. And we, we have a group in Forest Grove who is in place to facilitate anything that may need to be done on the ground. For Chamawa, which is a much bigger problem, you know, hundreds of graves and potentially dozens of unmarked graves. Um, that's something that really needs to be, I mean, it's, in my opinion, the Department of the Interior's job. They should be paying somebody to facilitate the work with the tribes to make those decisions. So I hope that that is what happens. We can, though, of course, support Native organizations. The, the organization that's most directly involved in this work is the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. Um, you can visit their website. They take donations. They also have a lot of resources. And they have things like curriculum guides. If you happen to be a teacher and want to teach about this, they have resources up there. The Native American Youth and Family Center in Portland is a wonderful organization that we can support locally that you know supports um, current Native families and Native youth. And then there are, depending on where you live, I would just highly recommend um, supporting, visiting, donating, going to events and so on um, that are open to the public through the tribe in your area. Just as an example, the Chichali Museum is um, the cultural, the head of the cultural center for Grand Ronde. And um, anyway, I would just recommend getting involved and visiting and supporting Native culture. On top of that, just in general, we can all support Native sovereignty, we can vote for people who support Native sovereignty, and we can stand up against injustice against children that is currently going on. Um, one important lesson for me about this whole history was that a lot of the people who supported these schools in the 1800s were the progressives of their day, and they thought of themselves as doing good. They thought well, isn't this great that we're, you know, turning these children into American citizens? 
Um, we can't be blinded by whatever our sort of narrow political focus might be. We really have to think about like, is what we're supporting harming people? And, um, you know, not just sort of blindly follow any particular political line. All right, that is the end of my presentation. And so um, I do wanna invite you to visit the website where we documented all of this. The link is up there on the screen. And also if you have anything you'd like to share with me, that is my permanent email address, archives at pacificu.edu. Thank you, Ava. That was very enlightening um, and, um, and sad, but we've got to deal with our history um, bring it to light and uh, process it and um, try to be, try to continue to be a fair society going forward. Um, I, I have a, a question. I've been um, looking at Henry Louis Gates's Finding Your Roots um, presentations on Oregon Public Broadcasting on Tuesday evenings, which has been really interesting and he has um, a lot of um, ancestry for uh, Black Americans and um, talked about how records, census records before 1870 did not have names of slaves. And so I was thinking about the Native American deaths and wondering if much has been done with the genealogy um, for the, the families of the, the deceased students. Is that a, something the tribe tends to take on? Um, um, tribes, tribes definitely are the ultimate authority on um, genealogical questions. Um, but for the work that that we did, um, census records and um, what were called Indian census rolls were actually a major source of information. So um, I guess kind of the blessing and the curse of how tightly the government was surveilling the tribes in the late 19th century is that they actually kept many records. Like you can find oftentimes a lot more detail and records in the census post about 1870, 1880 on native families than you can for many white families. I'm just talking about census records um, because they would actually, census takers would actually come through reservations and do a yearly census. So we have been able to find a lot of genealogical information and that has helped a lot in things like making sure that we have the correct names and um, correct tribal affiliations. Uh, but, and also I should say that we aren't, we aren't even, Suanne and I are not even the first people who have really looked into that in detail. Um, there's been like the, I think it was the Willamette Valley Genealogical Society actually published in a newsletter in the early 1990s an attempt to do something very similar to what we were doing, which is to, you know, account for all the burials and all of the deaths. So their work was really helpful to us in kind of tracking down some of the documentation. Very good, thanks. And Al Christians has a question. Al, wanna come on and ask your question? Oh, yes. Um, you mentioned a little bit about the, the uh, concept of uh, privatizing, breaking up the, the reservations into private plots and mm -hmm. such. And I'm interested in that because I saw an economics paper, I think it was by, by some uh, advocate of free market economic theories who said that the history is such that, oh, the, the Native people were tremendously harmed by the failure of, of the U.S. government to give them individual plots. That's wrong. <laughs> Say straight up, because first of all, they did give them individual plots. Um, the Dawes Act. I, okay, actually, I should let you finish your question. I kind of no, spoke just, over you there. I, I you know, I, <laughs> I, I would figure that sometimes they did and sometimes they didn't, but whichever they chose, it was probably not what was best for the Native people. Yeah, you know? and, yeah. You tell me what the facts are. I don't really know anything about it. <laughs> 
Well, um, that point of view that you just said is like exactly what, what progressive leaders were saying in the 1870s that, um, you know, there were a lot of people who were, you know, what today would be sort of like center left people who were saying, hey, all these problems could really be solved if we just didn't treat native people in the special category of like, you know, a nation apart who had their own land and their own laws. If we just gave, if we made them all citizens and had them under the same laws that we have and gave each of them their own plots of land, well, that would be great. So I can see why that's an appealing argument. It's like, we're treating everyone equally and everybody gets to own land on their own and blah, blah, blah. The problem was that um, what actually happened, so they passed the Dawes Act in the 1880s, which um, was intended to break up all of the reservations. And so many, many of the reservations in the Pacific Northwest were broken up and privatized, you know. What actually happened was that, um, first of all, which native family gets which piece of land on the reservation? There was a lot of jockeying about that. So like influential families could be given the really valuable land in the center. Then, you get carpetbaggers coming in. You have these people who are living in really extreme poverty. Somebody comes along and says, hey, I'll buy your land for you know, X amount of money. Then you, you know, 10 years down the line, you're homeless. You know? So what ended up happening was that a lot of the tribal lands were um, just sort of decimated only little tiny bits of them were left here and there. That made the tribes kind of disperse. So it had this horrible effect on native culture. And um, it's something that most of the tribes in the Pacific Northwest have been kind of trying to come back from ever since that time. Um, yeah, I think it, well, it's a much longer discussion than what I just <laughs> gave you, but I would definitely really push back on that idea that private property will solve all the problems. It really doesn't, you know, it did not, factually did not solve the problems for the tribes in the Northwest. We've got a question from Willie Wilworth. Um, Willie, do you want to come on and um, explain your question or ask your question? Go ahead, Willie. Um, how were the children chosen to be extracted? Was that like from the census and some government officials said, we want to take 10 from this group and 10 from that group? And then did the police just come in and grab them and kidnap them? Or were they like the orphans of the tribe and the, the tribe gave whoever they wanted to to them? So it changed a lot over time. You know, we're talking about these practices of taking children from the tribes, you know, started around 1880 and didn't end until like the 1960s. So, and it happened all over Till when? the 1960s. They were still doing it in the 1960s? Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. So um, the story, and it happened, you know, all over the United States and it also happened in Canada and Australia. So the story, I guess what I'm getting at is um, the story of how children were chosen and how they were taken can be very different depending on like which particular time you're talking about, which place. Um, what I'm most familiar with through my own research is how it happened for students at the Forest Grove Indian School in the 1880s. And um, that was at the very beginning of the whole system being started and so it was different in the 1880s for sure than what it was like in the 1920s but in the 1880s there weren't yet all this like kind of bureaucratic uh apparatus to sort of support um the like really systematized taking of children and so in the eight, early 1880s it was still done on a very kind of like uh, like personal basis, I would say what what the how it worked back then was that the superintendent of the school would write to the white overseer of the of the um, reservation, the, who was called the Indian agent. So the superintendent would write to the Indian agent and say, "Hey, I have this federal boarding school. I want. Can you please contribute some children 
And the Indian agent on the reservation could either write back, yes, we have some children who this would work for, or they could say, no, we're not giving you anyone. <laughs> and so like in the case of Forest Grove, Forest Grove Indian School had a relationship with the Congregational Church, which is of course Protestant. And so the Indian agents at um, reservations that had Catholic ties in general refused to send children to Forest Grove. Um, so during the 1880s, there was that sort of uh, possibility of refusal by the Indian agents, which was not possible at a later date. One of the children, like the daughter of the chief, didn't you yeah. say one girl that died? So he must have chosen her. The chief must have chosen her, right? Yeah, so the Spokane children is a special case. Um, oh, so I should actually just follow up a little bit about what the Indian agents would do once they got this request. We, this is something that actually still needs research, but from what I've been able to kind of piece together, I think what the Indian agents would usually do is they would look first in the on-reservation school. They'd say, oh, well, we already have 35 children in our on-reservation school. Let's pull out 10 of them and send them to the Forest Grove Indian School. So most of those children coming from the reservations where Indian agents selected them seem to have mostly come out of their local schools first. Um, but the, the case with the Spokane tribe, the one where we saw the two side-by-side -side photos, that was different because um, how that occurred was that superintendent the time he went to get children from the Spokane, he was actually under a lot of criticism in the press. The press was saying, well, you know, is this really doing, you know, they said they would help end the Indian Wars. They said they would do this and that, but really all they're doing is a shell game. They're shuffling children from the local reservation schools to this federal school. It's not really <laughs> doing anything new. That was the criticism. So, the superintendent was like, okay, well, I'm gonna go find some children who aren't in a school. And so he was a former army officer. He had actually met through his work in the, in the army, many different tribal leaders. So he targeted the Spokane tribe as a possibility. He also wanted people from Colville and he ended up not getting them by the way. But anyway, he actually personally went, he went on a trip we, we know about this because it's in the financial records. He went on a trip. He went all the way up the Columbia River. He traveled personally, found an interpreter, went and talked to Chief Lott of the Spokane, persuaded Chief Lott to send children from his tribe. Chief Lott sent his own son and several other boys. The superintendent brought them to Forest Grove, but he wanted girls too. Not surprisingly, the tribe didn't want to send girls off with this, you know, 40 year old army officer. <laughs> what parent would, right? So Wilkinson went back about six months later and this time he brought his own daughter who's 16 years old with him. And the superintendent plus his daughter visited Chief Lot. Um, he was giving, the superintendent was giving the Spokane children um, I would say kind of special treatment. He was writing a lot of letters back and forth to Chief Lott. Anyway, he went back, he managed to persuade Chief Lott to send his own daughter, as well as several other girls from the school and some more boys. So that picture that we see of the before is actually the second group of Spokane children who were sent. And they were a special case, specially selected by the superintendent to demonstrate that he could get children from a tribe that didn't currently have their children in the school. That was a long answer. That's what I wanted to know. Yeah, but later in later years, from what I understand, it was much more sort of bureaucratic. The police didn't just show up and grab some kids. They did do that in later years. Yeah, um, in that, that was what the situation I was talking about was like the early 1880s and by the 1920s things were really different and at that point I think it was you know by the 1920s historians think that I think it's 83 percent 
of school-aged children on reservations were being put in these institutions. So at that point, by the 1920s, it really was that like tribal police could show up on your doorstep and take the children. That's not a, that's not hyperbole. That sort of thing really did happen, but it happened at a later date than the, than the main history that I've been researching. Thank you. We've got a question from David Beam. David, would you unmute and ask your question? Yeah. Um... Back in the 90s, I spent three years working with the tri Klamath tribe government, which you probably know is a combination of the Klamath, the Yahuskin, and Modoc tribes. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was there to work with them on economic development and long range planning and that type of work. Um, everything you talk about, you know, I have no problem at all. Yes, it's, they have a horrific, horrific history. Uh, certainly, this is just one of many horrific pieces of history they have with the white man. Um, and it should be documented and all, it should be educated, everybody should be educated and make sure we know this, none of this stuff ever happens again, all that stuff. That said, um, one of the f challenging parts of my work was that it seemed like an awful lot of people, the tribal, the tribes, but are really basically in what I call the victim mentality. Um, they, they just don't think they can do anything to better their lives. You know, they, they seem to really focused on what happened in the past and their victims. And yes, it's all true, but they can't seem to get out of the mode of, I can make my life better. And so they, you know, they just don't take advantage of opportunity and all that other stuff. I was wondering if you ever came you know, across this kind of stuff and pe are there people out there in the tribes and stuff like that are trying to work with people? I mean, I know it's a whole psychological thing and all that sort of thing, but are there people out there trying to get them to look a little more forward into the future and to better their lives of their tribes? Well, I'm sure there are many people in the tribes who are working to better things. I can't really speak to, yeah. you know, um, exactly what each tribe is doing. Um, you know, I think that, some of what I've been hearing about from people in tribes, you know, by attending like the conference of the Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition, things like that, is that these events that happened, even though they may have happened like, you know, 40, 50, 100 years ago, they're still reverberating today. And like, it's not just an isolated event that happened 40 or 50 years ago. It's a trauma that's like still reverberating. And organizations like that coalition that I mentioned, one of, they have a kind of uh, part of their mission is to kind of educate the general public, but their core mission is healing for the families who went through it. Like they are acutely aware that many families are still sort of um, stuck in this trauma. It's not an imaginary trauma, you know, it's real. And they need, they need healing, but it's not something that we <laughs> can go in as outsiders who aren't tribal members and kind of be like, we're going to save you and we're going to give you healing. It's something that um, should be coming from within the tribes, should be something that's, you know, culturally appropriate that they want for themselves. So I guess the answer is that yes, there are people within tribes working to heal this trauma. But I also just want to say that, you know, it's kind of like telling a depressed person, like, well, why don't you just get happy? Start smiling. <laughs> like, that's not really how it works. It's like there's a, like real work that needs to be done to make that healing happen. Thank you. Joyce Lackey has a question. Um, Ava, I just want to make a comment first too. There's a book 
called My Grandmother's Hands about how trauma is inherited. And that might add uh, some clarity also. It's, it's, it's directed to blacks, but it's about the idea that trauma can run down through generations. But my question is, we all know that um, medical care was in a horrendous state until the Enlightenment and the, the types of medical care that were available were often very unsuccessful and more traumatic than the disease. But I'm wondering how much of the, the death was was responsible was caused by lack of attention to medical care and how much was actually were these kids cheated of the medical care that was available the school consistently employed a doctor like from the very beginning and they always had some kind of like sick room or hospital or something like that on the school ground so they didn't you know it wasn't like there was just zero medical care being given. Um, the issues were more sort of in like the underlying conditions. So like tuberculosis was the, by far the biggest killer at the school. For much of the early history, so talking like 1880s and even into the 1890s, they didn't know that tuberculosis was um, contagious. They thought it was the traditional view was that tuberculosis or consumption, as it was then known, was actually a genetic disease. And so they sort of felt, you can see it in their medical reports that they underline that it's tuberculosis because they wanna make it clear that this is an inherited disease <laughs> that they had nothing to do with. So in reality though, if you look at, the history of tuberculosis in the 19th century. Um, so it was communicated by people being in close quarters and the children were being packed into these dormitories under poor conditions. If they didn't already have tuberculosis, they would absolute, there's like a hundred percent chance that they would be exposed to it at the school. Once people catch tuberculosis, um, I've looked at some historical medical studies and Normally, if you catch tuberculosis, you will, the normal thing is to have it kind of latent, a little bit like HIV, that you have it, but it's latent. It has to progress to the active form of tuberculosis for it to become deadly. And so that is sort of like where the like care and conditions at the school, I think really contributed to deaths um, was that people who are living in poverty or who are living under high stress, just in general, and this is not just at boarding schools, but like in slums, people living in poverty tended to progress from the passive form to the active form of the disease. And then once you get the active form, then the quality of care that you're given can have something to do with how long you would live. They didn't have a way to cure it. That didn't come along until antibiotics, but you know, white people would often live with tuberculosis, active tuberculosis for years or even decades before it killed them. Um, like the president of my college, um, he had tuberculosis. He had it probably at least from the 1850s. He died in 1879. He was able to make it for a long time because he had a lot of money, he had good food, he had, he had all these things kind of supporting him. The children at the school, we're living, you know, from what I hear from families of students who went there like in the 20s, they had thin blankets. They didn't have enough blankets for all the children. The food that they were giving was like, you know, porridge. It wasn't the same food that they had at home. They were away from their families. If you can imagine being seven or eight years old and being really sick and basically being told us to, to lie down in a bed all day in a sick ward with nobody who could speak your language. I mean, it was just, there are all these things that contributed. Um, it wasn't just the infection rate. It was like what happened before and after the infection that, in my opinion, contributed. There's actually a researcher who's um, finishing up a PhD. His dissertation is on um, the overall kind of public health measures and death rates in the entire federal boarding school system. And so his work may help kind of flesh out some of the like systemic detail in this. Anyway, that was a very good question. Well, Thank it sounds you. like there wasn't intentional neglect. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say when you say intentional, it's more, I would say, like the way that the system was set up made it so that you could only read it as in one sense, you could only read it as intentional neglect. It's like, if you're not giving schools enough money to feed the children, yeah. is that intentional neglect? I would say probably yes, but it might not have been intentional neglect by the staff members running the cafeteria. It's more like neglect by the people who are funding the system. And then, the, you know, and then on top of that, some of the administrators of these schools were awful people. Yeah. Some of them did skim money. Some of them did abuse the children outright you know, not just neglect them, but actively abuse them. And um, so it's not just like, oh, everybody was trying to do their best and just some people fell through the cracks. It's actually like worse than that. Yeah, thank you. Mike Bershay, um put a, a mostly a comment into the chat, but um, there might be a question in there, Mike. Do you wanna come on and? What? like the makeup of the Supreme Court now is pretty heavily Christian nationalistic. And there's a lot of senators um, who also follow that ideology. And um, so much of it, they seems to be, it seems to be like misguided good intentions, like you mentioned before about the Chinawas, Chinawas school, those. And um, I'm just kind of, kind of bracing myself in case um, it, that, either Trump or somebody much worse will take over the White House and such things will be instituted. And I think uh, that's kind of what uh, would be on uh, Betty DeVos's agenda. Oh. But I'm, I could be just uh, being alarmist. Well, I think most tribes were not pleased. So I'm definitely not a political scientist. <laughs> So I can't speak in great detail about this. I do think that most tribes were very alarmed at a lot of things that were happening under the Trump administration. Um, I think if any administration today tried to impose a similar system where they were taking children from tribes, that um, tribes are in a much stronger position right now than they were, you know, in the 1920s, for example. Today, there's they've got more political clout, they have more money, they have more, you know, people caring about what they think. They have sovereignty that's been backed up in legal cases. So I think that it would be, it would not be tolerated if the exact same system of like forced removal well, of children, not, uh, exactly. that wouldn't work. No, but, oh, go ahead. Oh, um, but you know, there's all kinds of other ways that things could happen that we may not even be, I mean, I think it's more likely that some other group would be targeted, you know? Yeah, you know, well- Recent um, immigrants or something like that. Or for... um, non-Christian, you know, non-believers. Yeah, we and don't really know. At, um, who's in charge of, uh, who's governor of Texas now? And you see what's being, in, you know, instituted against um, abortion providers or, you know, unwanted pregnancies. And I'm not putting anything past that guy. <laughs> so, and, you know, since recently the Supreme Court upheld those abortion restrictions, well, what else are they going to uphold that'll suit their agenda? Well, maybe we should have a program on soon dealing with abortions and those questions. Yeah. That's all I have to say. So. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, any other questions before we wrap things up? Okay. Thank you very much for your interesting and heartfelt presentation, Doc, uh, Professor Gugamos. Anyway, I, I thank you, uh, Professor Eva. You uh, were very lucid and very uh, comprehensive in an issue that uh, most of us have a smattering of information on. Uh, having lectured at the church right opposite your campus at Pacific University many, many years ago about well-being and health 
uh, I know somewhat about that area. It was my only time in Forest Grove. Anyway, the question is, all the hollybaloo about the uh, teaching in the schools of cultural history, uh, the things that they don't want kids exposed to, because it might change their perception of who they are as white uh, Americans and uh, who have good intentions. Uh, does the Indian problem fall into that same category? Interesting question. Um, so here's my personal opinion. I think that it should not fall into this. I mean, it may be perceived as being, you know, when we talk about these, these things, I can see that there would might be people who would say that, you know, this is just one more like thing that's, um, you know, trying to punish white people or make them feel guilty. And we should really be focusing on something else. I can see somebody saying that. However, I think this is my opinion is that it should actually be something that either liberal or conservative people would be concerned about because what would conservative people least like to happen to their children? I would say being taken to a federal facility where you're not allowed to speak your home language or, po or practice your own religion. And if you look at it in that lens, I feel like it's something that people across the political spectrum should be able to recognize as a very poor idea. But like we, none of us want our children being indoctrinated. <laughs> um, and so from that point of view, I feel like there is a, a story for people of many different um, political persuasions that they could you know, get behind learning about these schools and why they were a bad idea. Um, gosh, there's a lot more I could say about this as an historian, but um, just about how I think history should be taught, but I don't want to go on <laughs> too long. So yeah, that's basically my feeling is that I, I hope that this is something that isn't a divisive issue, but that we can all recognize is really a very bad period a very bad idea um, in, you know, in government. 